Kjetil Haug, welcome to the Goa podcast. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit nervous now because uh, you asked me if we should do it in Norwegian or English, and then you told me that your, your English is almost better than Norwegian, so I mean, that I'm going to look the fool here. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll try our best, both of us. Yeah. How is it uh, being back in uh, Salzburg? It's nice. It's a, it's a good feeling. Uh, I mean, I was here... Well, I was born not far away from here. Uh, I played there when I was 13, 14 years old. Uh, I've only been there for holiday because uh, I've been, I mean, quite a few other places since then. Uh, so being back in Salzburg and playing for Salzburg, it's, I mean, it's a nice feeling. It feels like feels like home, but like it. Actually, when I came back in the summer, it was I actually made my de- debut for the first team, which it didn't feel like because I feel like I've been in this club and been part of this club for so long. But um, it was actually my first game for the club uh, in the summer. So, but it's nice to be back home again. Yeah, because I remember my first period here uh, from 2016 to 2018. Yeah, I remember always in during the the summer break. You're always here with training with us and with Jari Knutsson. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I also feel that you've, I've, I've, I haven't known you, but all, always known you, uh, who you are yeah. so, and where you're from. So uh, like knowing of each other. Yeah. Yeah. But no, it's it's nice. It's 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 always good to come home. And like I said, like I feel like I've been in this club for so many years, but I've actually only been here for a couple of years. But it's so it's it's a strange feeling, but uh, it's good. Yeah, D- tell me a bit about the the process this summer uh, when you came back. Obviously, uh, I was playing, then I um, picked up a few injuries, uh, a bad form in a couple of games, and then uh, yeah, just tell me how, because I think it's interesting for for the viewers and the listeners to, to just hear how how it what go on behind the scenes um, in the transfer. Yeah, it was a bit of a not a rushed process, but um, in the beginning I was I wasn't prepared to go on loan or go anywhere I was like I was quite happy where I was in France and I didn't have the game time I wanted so it was always an option um, but then we had international break in a few days off uh, so I went away with my wife to this like beach beach hotel in Montpellier in France just like having a glass of wine and relaxing like turning off and then all of a sudden my agent calls me and says um, you know, there's, uh, there's two clubs that kind of want you on loan. Um, one of them is Salzburg, and another club was a club in France. Um, and then I was like, okay, there's pros and cons to both of them. Uh, but then we kind of decided that I think this is going to be too rushed to do anything. So it's better to like leave it and wait. And then I went down for dinner with my wife. And when we came back up, my agent just called me again and said, uh, like the, the club wants a decision. Like we need, we need to figure out a decision whether you want to go or you don't want to go. So I was like, okay, it's it's very tempting. Salzburg, it's my hometown. I've always wanted to come back and play here again. Uh, so then, when that opportunity came and we finalised all like the details about when I was going to leave and things like that. I, next day, I got on the plane and uh, yeah, 24 hours later, I was training here in Salzburg. Nice. It's it's. It's been a good. Uh, it's been really good to know you. Uh, you know the goalkeeper union is always something special. So even though there's like a competitor coming in uh, with us as well, there's a big gap in age. It's, it's eight eight years. Yeah. So being a decent enough human being to understand the situation from the club and mm. also you that you want to come and play, I think it's really important for for yeah for other goalkeeper groups or other clubs to, to know that it's it's important because the goalkeeper union is so tight so uh, it's been a it's been a pleasure getting to know you and so we've had had a lot of fun in training even though the old man has been struggling <laughs> a little bit with his groins <laughs> that's not that's normal but uh no, it's like you said i think the goalkeeper group it's is very special in many ways i think because like you're all competing for one spot but then again you're all for me the goalkeeper group is always the closest group like you so good friends but you're also call it enemies in some kind of way because you're all fighting for the same spot but like the way you guys all of you have welcomed me and supported me and backed me and like i've tried to do the same in training we all push each other we all want each other to get better and we all support the the one who plays at the weekend and 
as you know in this game that can change from week to week so I mean for me I've only got good things to say about everyone in this club and especially the goalkeeping union why do you think that is that the goalkeeper union is always at least 95 percent of the time the goalkeeper union is always almost the same at every club why do you think that we as goalkeepers can have that we can compete but to at the same time have that good environment uh because you hear about when i talked about uh talked to rafik Zagnini, he mm. told me that when he is signed for fiorentina the other um, wingers were just clipping him in training yeah. Uh, <laughs> why do you think, what's your opinion and what do you think goalkeepers can have this nice environment? It's, it's a difficult question to be honest because when you think about it, you always hear that, say you go from Norway to a different country, you always say that, oh, the environment is more brutal, like it's tougher when you go abroad and things like this. But like for me, I've been in now three different countries and the goalkeeping union has always been strong in all these countries. It's not like... It's the same, you're fighting for the same spot, but you're always friends, regardless of the culture or like where you are, which part of the world you're in. So I think I think it's I think goalkeepers in general were known for being a bit weird, a bit <laughs> a bit strange. Yeah. Uh, but you're also like you kind of as a goalkeeper, you're a bit isolated, some sort. You you're very much on your own, in your own group. Uh you train for yourself kind of thing. It's it's almost like an individual sport in a team sport. And then I think to be in the team sport and still have that individual side of it, you need to be able to connect with all the other goalkeepers as well. And I think that's why goalkeepers like kind of always stay together, even though we're, we're still fighting for the same sport. <laughs> but it's, it's a difficult question because it's a good question because yeah. I've, I, I don't really have the answer to it. We all have the same glitch. We do. Glitch in the brain. <laughs> <laughs> We're known for that. Yeah. So, but if we uh, travel back a few years, you started in uh, Kvikalden. Correct. Uh, so just take me a little bit about, uh, yeah, leading up to the trials uh, you had for some for, for some big clubs. Yeah, it was, uh, I played for about 14 years or from I was 6 to 14 in Kvikhalden that's like my home home club um, and then when I was about 12 13 I started going on like the Kretslag which we call it in Norway which is for like the the zone you're in in Norway uh, performed okay there went into the regional regional team and then eventually got called up to the under 15 national team uh, by then, I've also transferred from Kvikalden to Salzburg and played for the the under 19 at that point in Salzburg. Um, performed well at the under 15 national team with Norway, um, and I think at that stage, there's always going to be clubs from different countries, scouts, like everyone's watching you. Um, and then one day in in the mail, my dad, well, I came down to go to dinner and my dad had this like big letter in front of him. Uh, I had no idea what it was. He turned it around and I saw like a Everton, Everton logo on the top corner. I was like, mm, like what, what is this? And I could see like, he had this like cheeky, happy smile on his face. So I was like, okay, this, like he, surely it can't be what I think it is. Uh, but then it was a letter from like one of the scouts people at Everton asking if, um, I wanted to come over for three, four days, do a trial, get to know the club, train with the club so they could see me, I could see them. So, I mean, when you're 15 years old and being a professional goalkeeper is your dream, it's it's an opportunity you can't say no to. So, uh, I mean, I think we answered back as soon as we could. Uh, there's a number <laughs> at the bottom we could call, so I think it didn't take many, many seconds before we called that number, I think. Because you, you were on loan spells, no, not loan spells, but trials in, correct me if I'm wrong, in Arsenal, Manchester City, United and Everton? Uh, yeah, I never actually went to Arsenal. Okay. I went to Everton, United and City. And then I think once you go to like a few of them clubs, there's always going to be other English clubs that picks up. So it's not it's not wrong with you. I, I had a interest from Arsenal and Chelsea or an option to go and trial at Arsenal and Chelsea as well. But I think we kind of said I've already been to three different English clubs, I guess it's going to be quite similar. So like I've seen the environment, I've 
I've been there now and done like a week and a half, two weeks of trials. So I didn't really feel like I needed to go on another trial. So it's more like go home, like freshen your mind up and then eventually make a decision of what you're going to do with your future. <laughs> but how was it then uh, as a young boy, 15? Yeah, I was 15, 15 when I decided and yeah. 16 when I officially moved. Okay. But how was it then to go on these, these trials? How was it going to the clubs, training-wise? How long were the trials? Uh, it was very professional. Uh, like you, Everything is booked for you, like the travels. You have someone meeting you at the airport with like a schedule, what you're going to do, where you're going to be. You have someone picking you up, driving you places. Uh, I mean, we came there, went to training. Uh, you always have someone with you who explains what you're going to do next. Went out for dinner with the scout person and the, um, like the president of the or the academy head director, um, just to get to know like how the clubs works and things like that. So I think I spent three days. I did three days in Everton first. Went back to Norway and then I did four days at United and then drove for about 15 minutes straight to the other side of Manchester and did three <laughs> days at Manchester City. So, I mean, it's it's hectic, it's difficult mentally because like it's a full week where you have to be, you have to be switched on mentally for like, not just for like the training, but for like, you want to give a good impression of yourself and like, so everything, when you go out for dinner, when you're being driven to and from training, you want, you always want to be like up and ready for it. So, I mean, I've, I can remember I was really tired when I got back home, but it's, I mean, it's a cool experience, definitely. It sounds really exciting because at that age, you know, when you see the clubs and you can see it almost as your dreams is, is, are, are coming true. Yeah. Um, did you travel alone or was your, were your dad with you? Or? I always travel with my dad. Uh, my mom came on the first trip as well to Everton. Uh, but I think that was more for her own sake than my sake, to be yeah. honest. But uh, my dad always traveled me, with me. Uh, but I think that was just, I mean, I was under 18 at that point. It was a comfort for me and also a comfort for the for the clubs, I think, to know that there's someone there with you in case. Because, I mean, it can be as exciting as it sounds. It can also be quite difficult mentally because coming into a new culture, new environment, mm -hmm. new country, new language, new people, uh, I mean, it's it was it was so exciting at that time. Yeah. So you go there for training, and then when you're done for the day, you're just drained at the end. Yeah, you like drained, but also like so excited because like in your head you keep on asking yourself all these questions like, oh, how did I do? Uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I should have done this. Uh, what did they think of me? What, what's going to happen in two? Like, you just sit and ask yourself all these questions that you don't know the answer to, which can also tire yourself out mentally. Yeah. So I think it's also important that, like, if you ever go on these kind of adventures, go on trials somewhere too. Like, yeah, you're going to take everything in and be as switched on mentally as you can, but also remember when you're finished for the day, remember to switch off because, like, you still have a few more days where you're going to perform and no one can be 100% switched on mentally for four or five days straight on. No, that's that's really true. That's that's draining. That's draining. Yeah, yeah. But when when I watch these clubs, there's two clubs in particular. Did you have an offer both from City and United? Yeah. Well, I had an official offer from City, uh, and United wanted me to come back over. Uh, well, they said it was more so we could finalize the offer and just to get to know a few more people. But at that time, I think I'd already made my mind up from what I'd experienced when I went to trials. So that was the reason I, I never actually went back to United again. I just went straight to straight to Manchester City. So, so basically, City were a bit ahead of United in terms of having an offer already. Yeah. Uh, and you had a good feeling about City as well. So yeah, that, definitely. So then when you travel ho back home to Norway, even though United were a bit interested still, you had made up your mind to, to go to City. Yeah, I think in my head, pretty much as soon as I finished the uh, uh, training spell at Manchester City, I kind of knew that 
this is where I want to be. Um, I mean, they're both amazing places, amazing clubs. But for me, it was just, I was more nervous when I was at United than when I was at City. Because mm. I feel like it was just something, it felt like comforting and homely when I was at City. It was more like, I remember coming into like my first session meeting the goalkeeping coach. He was like a 55, 60 year old, uh, 60 year old coach. He was super friendly, super nice. Uh, I don't I, like. I don't even think I was nervous for my first session. Like we would, it was so like relaxing environment, and everything just felt nice and comfortable. Yeah. So I think that kind of, that was like, maybe the main reason why why I chose City over over United. That's that's a nice detail though because, in probably not in this in this case the training ground and stuff probably was really really good in City so. There was nothing to complain about there, but just when you have just the the feeling you have with people working there, the sensation you have mm. mentally, you just feel at home. Yeah, that means a lot because if you go into an environment and you feel it's a bit cold, a bit harsh, you don't feel settled. No, it certainly affects your performance uh, on the pitch in the goal. Definitely. Yeah. So, but how was the? The change of like training in uh, goalkeeper training in your age, coming from Norway and then to City. So just your selected City. Tell me about your time there, training wise. Did you get a chance to train with the first team and all that stuff? So just tell me about the uh, and also moving at such a young age alone yeah i can start with the moving process the moving process was obviously when you move when you're 16 you can't move into your own place you need to you need to live with something we call digs like a home like another family so i moved when i was 16 over to about 15 minutes from the city center to a completely new family it was uh, a wife and a husband in about 50 55 years old who worked obviously with the club so just the uh, driver from uh, the club came and picked me up at the airport, drove me to the house, dropped me off in my bag, and this is my new family for the next two years. Uh, so again, it's like uh, when you're 16, it's, it's a strange feeling. Um, but I mean, all that went okay, went into training and stuff. And the training wise, I think it was more uh, physical and technical uh, than what I was used to in Norway. Um, Everything was higher speed. Uh, the quality was higher. The players, the the coaches. Um, I mean, training wise, everything was good in Norway as well. But I think everything was like, for me, two three steps up from what I was used to. Um, so yeah, we just, and then played for the under 18s for about two years. Went up to the under 21s. Um, and then, as you asked earlier, I had a few sessions with the first team. Uh, that was a couple of sessions when uh, Mancini was the coach and a few sessions when uh, Guardiola came as well. So Ooh. kind of uh, experienced the best of the best. Wow. Yeah. Mancini and Guardiola. It's not, it's not the two worst coaches in the world, is it? <laughs> <laughs> How did you then feel inside going up and training with the first team? How was how was it? Like in the beginning, it was kind of nerve wracking, uh, but also like exciting because you know, like you you want to show yourself, you want to perform, even though they they know of you, they know like your qualities. If not, you wouldn't have been there in the first place. But it's also like you want to show how good you are. I want them to see how good you are. Uh, but again, for me, like when I, I remember my first session with Guardiola, it was like I didn't think he'd have a clue who I was. Mm. I th for me, he was. I was probably just like some academy goalkeeper that he just needed. Yeah. Like I remember coming into the first session, he, he comes up to you, he puts his arm around you, like to your face, like say your name, uh, how, how you doing, show, have like a conversation with you. You you're excited to be here for the first, like it was so like normal and like that kind of made me feel again a lot more settled. So you go into the session being super nervous and then like a. Uh, maybe a 15, 20 second conversation kind of changes everything, which for me is like 
kind of another proof of why he's done what he's done with his career. Like it's the small things that people don't see every day that for me was so vital to me probably being able to perform at least 10, 15% better at that training session than what I would have if my shoulders were up here and I was so nervous, which you probably know yourself from being around. Yeah, that's class really, because mm. those small stuff means the world to the player. Yeah. If you have a, a first team coach or a sports director or whoever has like a, a big role in, in a club, just neglect you and don't give you any attention, don't say hi, nothing. It sets the tone for your mental state before just coming into the to the place and then um, afterwards going out and, and performing training and in games. So I think man management to deal with human beings on a, on a proper level is is so so important. So yeah, uh, I think it's it's more important than what people think because like yeah we're professional footballers but at the end of the day we're all we're all human we all have feelings we all want. We all want to be seen. So I think that for me is kind of changes a good coach to a very, very good coach. Or like, uh, like at the end of the day, you have to be a good human being to, to perform in your sport as well, I think. So you were at City and then you had, um, you were on a loan spell in, in Spain. Correct. Peralda, right? Yes. And it was like uh, Girona's second team yeah so it was Girona where you were on loan and yeah. then you were supposed to play for for the second team that's called Peralda yeah I yeah. was on loan at Girona because they had an injury mm. um, and went on loan to Girona as a third goalkeeper uh, but playing with they had the second team which was in I don't know division four or something in Spain um, so the plan was I was going to go over there train with Girona the first team which that was their first season in La Liga. Uh, so I trained with them every day and was supposed to play with uh, Peralada, the second team. Um, so I went over there again, new country, new language, new environment. Uh, really excited, really happy. Spent about about two weeks there. Um, and then it was maybe a day or two until my wife was going to come down. She was moving over to live with me. And then somehow managed to break my wrist in training uh, which again in football is injuries a part of it and sometimes they don't come at the best times or well, most of the time they don't <laughs> yeah uh, and then again it was like a new a new challenge within the new challenge like it was a challenge itself to move move to a different country again but then you have to deal with a wrist break and getting back from an injury again so it was the first couple of weeks was very difficult, both for me and my wife, I think, because she was so excited uh, and I was obviously excited for her to come and live with me. But then I had this injury that stopped me from playing and training, which kind of put a downer on the whole whole situation. Um, but we managed to go out of it, train, train myself back and got back in training after about seven, eight weeks, I think. This is really interesting, actually, because football is not only good stuff and it's never like just smooth sailing. Everything works out for you. There will be hardships. And actually today uh, I made a post that you were coming on the podcast actually about this subject that how how do you come back from injury dealing with all the the emotions surrounding injuries and also at the same time you have the risk of maybe losing your spot in the team. So how did you, how can you recall from this situation? Was it something you did? Did you talk to someone? Or how did you manage to, to fight your back um, back from, from the injury? I think it's also, I think it's always very, very difficult uh, mentally. Um, and I think everyone's different. Some people will dig themselves down and like be upset for a long, long time. Uh, for me, I've always said it's okay to be upset. You, sh you should be upset, you should be angry, you should be sad, but not for a long period of time. You're allowed to be upset, uh, be angry for a couple of days, but then after that, like your focus should be, okay, how quick can I get back on that pitch again? Because like, at the end of the day, your, your job isn't in, 
in the gym or to recover, like a job is to play football on the pitch and you can only do that if you fit. So I think for me mentally it's always been okay, you're allowed to be sad, you're allowed to be angry, but try to move past it as soon as you can and just take as you would if you were on the pitch. Like if you were training normally, you'd always go on the pitch and think, okay, today I'm going to give my 100% to get better. Mm. Have that same mentality when you're injured, when you do work with the physios, when you go in the gym. Like today I'm going to do 100% to recover a little bit better. So I'm going to get back to playing as soon as I can. And the, the, more, the more work you put in, in the gym and recovery, the quicker you're going to recover fully and be back to doing what you want to do. Couldn't agree more. Perfect. So then, after being in Spain, it went back to back to city, and then uh, eventually you were uh, coming back to to Norway. Yeah. So uh, went back to England again for a few months, uh, and then was at the end of my contract over there. Uh, wasn't going to renew the contract, so I knew I needed to find something else. Uh, and then I had uh, interest from Songdal in uh, in Norway, which was then in Oversligan. Uh, they had the goalkeeping coach of uh, Tadej Selesta, which I knew from the national team. Uh, and it was like we had a longer term plan for me. There was uh, another goalkeeper, Mat Matthias Dungeland, who now plays for Brann. He was there as well, and uh, we had a conversation that he was like he had been performing quite well and was most likely to get sold. Uh, and for me, it was like a, a good step to get my kind of career back on track again a bit because I hadn't been playing as many games as I would like. And I was coming up to like 19, 20 years of age and felt like I needed to play games. So I thought, again, that was going to be a good opportunity for me. So I moved over to Songdal and was prepared to not play for like the first couple of months to get into the new environment, get settled in and get to know the, the team and the players and stuff. Um, but it didn't end up as I thought it would. Uh, so I think Songdal for me and my wife was probably the toughest period mentally that we both had. Because uh, my wife is from, from Manchester, like big, big town, mm. big city. Moved to Girona for six months, which is also a big place, nice, warm, Spain. To then move to Songdal, where there's 7,000 people, <laughs> there's uh, nothing other than mountains yeah. around. Like, it's a beautiful place, but it's yeah. not like when you're, uh, no, you're used to the city. Yeah. It's not really a... It's almost a happening if the fish jumps in the river, it's a, it's a happening. Yeah, it's like a story in the newspaper. <laughs> so it's it's like it was a strange... A strange change and especially for my wife I think and I think that also affected me in some kind of way because I knew I knew she wasn't happy I wasn't playing uh, which meant I wasn't happy I think it's it's the same like if you if you're at a place and you're not happy but you're playing it's easier to forget that you're not happy mm -hmm. well if you're not playing and you're not happy it's like you got two bad things going on. Yeah. So it's like it's that was really difficult mentally, I think. Yeah. Because the, then the the talks and everything and all the stuff uh, and thoughts spinning in your head is yeah. all about uh, this is bad, 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 bad. Instead mm. of having something positive to to grip to have the hang on. So yeah. I can I can see that that's been difficult going also from from city to Songdal, which is a. Uh, in terms of clubs, it's also a big, big move. Yeah. That even though you're not giving up on your dream of playing for the biggest clubs, but it's it will be on hold because mm. you go to, you go from a Premier League club, even though from you've been in the academy and stuff, but you go to Norwegian football and an Obosligan, which is not even the highest league. So mentally, that's uh, I respect it a lot, though. You have to be brave to do that because doing that, you still have the the belief in yourself that you will get back to the to the high, highest level uh, eventually so yeah i think that's that's always a difficult thing when you're at that age because okay you've been especially when you've been in like the city academy you could could probably if i like waited a bit or tried i could maybe go to a better club and not be guaranteed to play or something but for me it was 
it was more of like a restart of my career. It's like the word I've always kind of used because okay, now I just need to, I just need to play. I need I need game time. I'm getting to the age now where games are so important, and I wasn't getting that. So, I mean, that was my thought process before I moved to Songdal. That this is the perfect place for me to get game time. Like I can hundred percent focus on my football. There's nothing else going around. I can just play games, try to perform as good as I can, and then see what happens in the year. Yeah. But you know, it's it's difficult to plan things <laughs> yeah, in, it in is this to, game. And yeah, for sure. <laughs> things can change with like injuries and like you know, you know yourself who's yep. who's been injured yep. quite a few times this season. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh how old were you when they, you came back to when you went to Songdal? I was nineteen, twenty I think. Yeah. Twenty. Because I had I was not chased by Arsenal, City, <laughs> United, and Everton when I was young. But I had in uh, if you in Norwegian football, I had kind of the same journey because I went from from Viking, Viking, yeah. who had a lot of money, it was a big club at the time. Mm. I had three senior goalies in front of me, yeah. so I went to to a smaller club on the outside, Brynø, mm. and I had a f- fantastic time yeah. there. Um, because I also wanted to play, uh, and I was 18 when I went there, yeah. so uh, I had to play almost 200 games in the Oberliga <laughs> before I got my chance with uh, with Salzburg in uh, 2016. Wow! So you you know yourself how difficult it can be because yeah. like you you know you want to play at a higher level, but you obviously have to perform at a different level to earn your chance to play at the higher level. Yeah. But it's, it's a Especially when in your head you know you're good enough, yeah. but you have to show it, and you really just want to kind of like jump over a step instead of okay, taking a step back to then take two three steps forward. Yes, it's for sure. And I think maybe you have to be a bit naive and a bit like delusional yeah. in your own head, because there's lots of people maybe around talking. Okay, now he will not probably not make it because it takes a step down and then ah okay that was that I feel sorry for him yeah. but then in your own head you know no no it's just wait and uh, you will be back so I think it's a good it's a really good lesson later on in the in the career to have that mental grit to just yeah. stay in it every day train play games even though you maybe have to start even on the second team for yeah. that for that team you know it's you learn so much about about yourself yeah uh, during those periods so it's very very valuable for sure but it's, i think it's always a it's a difficult decision as well because you feel like and everyone around you everyone like if you listen to other people they would say that okay you, you're taking a step back because you're going down a level but really it's not a step back it's a step forward just the year ahead kind of thing mm-hmm. like you you're not thinking oh, i'm just going to go to the best club you're thinking okay there's so many things to think about where where do I have the biggest chance of getting game time? Where do I have the biggest chance of performing? Uh, there's so many questions you have to ask yourself. So like taking or going to a smaller club or down a league, for me, is, isn't always classed as a step back. It, no. it could be a, easily be a step forward, but for other people, they would think, okay, he's like, he's, he's going back now, he's, he's finished. Yeah. Like that's kind of a word you hear about a lot of people who go down a league or go to a, a smaller club or, or it's finished now yeah. and then two three years ahead and then maybe they perform really well and so it's, it's it's a difficult decision to make but I think it's like you say you have to be you have to be mentally strong to be able to do it, I think yeah because I think that's a that's a big takeaway f- from this because there's many goalkeepers that just remains a second or third choice but I, n- I never wanted to to be a second choice or third choice no. because it, then it's easier to take the maybe the more comfortable route yeah. you're not seeking uh, challenges elsewhere loans getting away maybe in, in a lower level to, to play mm. uh, so I think that separates or uh, it does separate the, the guys that it's looked at as a number one and gets uh, picked by clubs as a number one mm. Um, further down their career, instead of then being brought into a club as a second choice, because you've always been that you haven't seeked challenge, you haven't seeked games, um, seeked uh, what you call it in English um, experience. Yeah. You know, I think that's a big lesson to to take 
take from from the journeys we we both had that yeah i think for me that's really important what you said there because it's i think it's so easy to get to get comfortable being at a good club and being a second choice because okay like you obviously you make friends you yeah. get comfortable in your situation but as soon as you get comfortable that's when things are going the wrong way yeah. like you yeah. sh you should never like obviously you should be comfortable you should never be too comfortable to like you said not seek challenges mm -hmm. and then yeah. going down a step proves to other people okay this guy wants to be number one yeah. he will do everything to play he will do everything to be number one compared to a guy who just thinks okay like i'm at a good club I've, i'm in a good place i've got good friends around me i'm just going to stay here yeah even though scott carson is allowed he's <laughs> yeah it's uh, kind of what people say is their dream job isn't it, it? Is, is it the best like it's almost the best job in football he has. Yeah, I think <laughs> for me, like being at that age, uh, you've seen so much, you've experienced so much being, it's probably, it must be like, I don't know him, so he must be like just this happy, amazing guy in the dressing room. Yeah. Because obviously to do what he does at a club like Manchester City, it's... Uh, Oh, it's interesting, but it's, yeah. it's also it's also quite cool in a way. Yeah, it is. It is for sure, and and it's not not to uh, to by any means uh, speak down on his career because he's played a load of games as yeah. well. But I think he he's enjoying himself. He, he gets to do what he always loved doing: being in goal, be happy with his family. Yeah. Like it looks amazing, earning good money as yeah. well. And so. there's, there's no right or wrong on what you should and shouldn't do, which is why this game is so difficult because you never have the answer ahead of you no. or in front of you. So, but I mean, if he's happy doing what he's doing, then yeah. that's great. Yeah. And I think it's also something you have to, like, it's not a thing you do when you're at the age of 21, 22. I think it's once you kind of coming to the end of your career. Hit my age. Yeah, I, I wasn't <laughs> going to say that, but that, that's, what, that's what I meant, really. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I will be 24 in March, man. It's yeah, crazy. still young. You got it's crazy. At least seven years left. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> not, not, the, not the year like this, though. No, no, no. no, no. Then, I'm, then it's like half a year, six months, and I'm done. <laughs> uh, so then you in the time and that were difficult. So you seeked challenge, and then it was Elverum. Yeah, so again, I went down a level uh, to go play. Uh, went to Elverum and actually played. Played half a season there from the summer to Christmas um, and did pretty well, performed pretty well. We were fighting for promotion to Oberstligen, uh, the second division in Norway. Uh, and performed well, didn't manage to get the promotion, but personally I had like a kind of a little little up in my career again because I was playing, I was performing. Um, and then went back to went back to Songdal again after that. And then I was hoping I was gonna come in and and play for Songdal because that was like what I had in my head. Okay, if I go and perform at Elverum now, I have a bigger chance of playing for Songdal for then have a bigger chance of going to a bigger club again. Mm. Obviously, I came back to Songdal and the situation was, was still the same. Uh, I was still on the bench there. And then I think that's also something that's really difficult when you you go from being on the bench to go and play for half a season, play, I think I played 16, 17 game, to then go back and sit on the bench again. It's, again, Rough. another challenge. So, uh, but then I think I was there for only a few weeks before um, Volleringer had uh, an injury on one of their goalkeepers and asked if I wanted to come alone for, in the beginning, three months, a loan spell, and then was supposed to go back to uh, back to Songdal again. Um, but again, came to Volleringer, decided, OK, I'm only here for three months, but if I show them how good I am and what I can do, maybe this can turn into something more, which it eventually did. Yeah. And then, so it eventually did. You signed a um, three-year contract with Volangen, was it? Correct, yes. And then it was uh, Adam Larsen, who was the first uh, the first choice, and then um, uh, Christopher Klaasson, uh, second, and you maybe, or, or you and him battling for, for second. Yeah. And, and as we know, he, uh, 
yeah, you can tell the story about your time there in, in Wallinga. Yeah, so the first class I was into when I went there on loan, so it was me and Adam, uh, and then class one eventually came back, uh, and then we were kind of fighting for the for the second spot uh, for the rest of the season. Uh, so we were like back and forth, and he was on the bench while Adam was playing. Um, and then the year after, Adam had quite a lot of injuries, troubles with his back, uh, didn't manage to train so much, um, couldn't play so much. Uh, and then it was kind of a decision of, OK, it was between me and Klaus on who was going to play and who was going to be on the bench. Uh, me, personally, I was ready to play. I felt like I deserved to play. Uh, felt like I had, for the six, seven months I've been there, done really well. Um, so I was, and then I remember there was Ronny Dylo was the coach. Coach then he called me into the office and said that kind of had, I think it was quite a harsh, uh, harsh conversation, a difficult conversation. But now when I look back, it a very good, very good conversation because he told me straight as this, like you're here because you're a good goalkeeper. Uh, but for me, the difference between you and Carlson is he has. Said like he has this fire in it. it. Looks, it looks like he wants to be. It looks like he wants to play. Like I can see it in him. And he said to me, he didn't feel like he could see that in me, which to me was then really hurtful because I knew myself how much I wanted to be here mm. and how much I wanted to play. So to hear that from the coach, the guy who's picking the team, was like hurt. Like I remember, I went out of the office and like I was so angry. Just wanted to go home. Didn't want to be there. Uh, like everything was just terrible, but then went home. Obviously, you sit at home and you think about what's been said, and, and just decided to myself that okay, like now I'm gonna go into training every day, and I'm gonna show him that the decision he made was wrong. I'm gonna show him how much I want to play, how much I want to be there, and even if I'm not playing, I'm gonna make sure that I'm gonna train 100% every single day. Because the chance will eventually come, and when the chance comes, I'm gonna make sure I'm ready for it. Did something change in your attitude in training, or or did you continue to 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 be the same? Maybe you were just misunderstood, or was there a, a switch that was flipped uh, after that uh, meeting? I think it was kind of a little bit of a switch. I think it was a conversation I kind of needed uh, because not that I was getting comfortable but I feel like I came to training I trained I did what I needed to do and then kind of went home which I guess is what he saw as me not wanting it as much as as Klaasson so after he said that I just kind of thought that okay like I'm really going to show him now like for me as I'm quite an introverted person. I'm not the loudest, mm. loudest in the group, not the loudest person, but okay, I'm gonna go out on that pitch and I'm gonna turn that off and kind of turn into not a different person, but like I'm gonna not be as introverted as I used to be. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of went a bit louder, a bit angrier, uh, kind of shouted at my teammates a bit more, uh, had a few like, tackles one by one situation that was kind of over the limit a bit mm. a bit too tough but that was my way of like showing him that the decision you made was wrong yeah i love that so really nice because, because you i was going that's why i'm i was asking because you are like a down to earth guy calm also in, in your goalkeeping i think you when you play you're calm it's there's there's nothing that's suddenly Big stuff happening, or it's it's really calm, solid. So, and also as a guy in, in the dressing room, you're like, you're not super quiet, but you're you're, you're a bit more quiet. So that's yeah. what I'm. Why I was asking. So, and then um, eventually, as we know, Klaasson got sold to uh, got sold to Leeds, and yeah, yeah. So I had my first my first game for Waring. I had when he. He got a red card against Myundarn. Uh, and I came on after about 30, 35 minutes, did 
probably one of my best games. Uh, managed to win the game 1 0. He had a red card, so I had to play the next game as well. Uh, I kept a clean sheet against Ogusun and did did another really good match. And then I was thinking, okay, like I've done one really good 60 minute game and another 90 minute game, so clean sheet. Like, surely, like, I'll, I'll keep playing now, kind of thing. But then I was straight out of the team again. Uh, <laughs> How was that? Again, like another challenge, you you kind of don't understand what's going on because you feel like, okay, what else do I have to do? Uh, but then again, you kind of just have to, okay, agree to disagree with the coach's decision and yeah, again, show him that, okay, you've made your decision, but it's, it's not the correct one. Uh, respect it, but don't respect it at the same time. Uh, so I just kept on fighting and then eventually he, Carlson got sold and uh, then I remember there was a lot of talks going around the club. So okay, we need we need another goalkeeper now. Like uh, okay, we got we got Sheffield, but he's he's hardly played, and is he good enough? And uh, we're gonna have to sign because I remember there was people saying okay, we need to sign uh, an older, more experienced guy who you know can go straight in and perform. And again, that was kind of I'm glad people said that because I used that as motivation to to mm. show them that. Like, come on, you don't need to go out and spend millions on another goalkeeper when look at what you have in the club already kind mm. of thing. So I did that and performed in the, the games that I had the, got the chance in and then eventually got the first first spot. Yeah, amazing. I really love that, like, your, in, your self-belief, though. It's, I, I love it. And you, you, you use it in the right way instead of getting discouraged and get passive. And then, oh, people think I'm shit and, and yeah. all this stuff that you're not good enough. Yeah. You use it as motivation to to turn it around, and also that they um, they are saying the wrong stuff about you. So, yeah, amazing. It, it's a difficult because like no one likes to hear bad things about yourself. You always want to hear people say positive things, yeah. but then it's also like, okay, how are you gonna use those bad things? It's easy to. Okay, you hear people say he's not good enough. Okay, it's easy to go home and just think, okay, maybe maybe I'm not good enough. Yeah. Like maybe this isn't what I should be doing. Maybe, maybe I'm just not at that level. Yeah. Like it's easy to get into that headspace of beating yourself down instead of using the bad things or the difficult things people are saying about you as motivation to prove them wrong. Yeah. For without sure. getting angry, like or like physically going to talk to them or having like a discussion you no. could you could do in so many different ways and for me it's always been about doing it on the pitch and proving without actually saying much but just proving them okay like i'm going to show you yeah show you that you're wrong now kind of thing and that's the best thing to do as well just perform well and yeah. play well that's the only only thing you can do to just to just clear the noise out yeah and i've Learning this as you go, learning this during your career as well, that you create like this this uh, siege mentality in your own in your own mind. That because there will be times in your career where you have you maybe have a couple of games um, where you're not playing great, bad run of form. There will be criticism right away. You know now you have like you have social media, newspapers. They are just looking for clicks because that's how they sell newspaper. They sell. Uh, advertising on the uh, online newspapers and stuff like today so it's everything is clickbait yeah so you have to take everything with a grain of salt best thing is to not read it at all yeah uh, of course you can have i have social media you have social media of course there can be the odd uh, dms uh, or comments uh, on your videos or, or or pictures but it's just noise it doesn't their voice doesn't have any value and I remember I was uh, in Cardiff actually uh, training at their training ground with the, uh, uh, I think there was the, uh, yeah, one of the youth goalkeeper coaches that had a session with me when I was in Brynne. Yeah. Uh, and I, we had a dinner with Richard Hartes, okay. uh, who were the former uh, first team goalkeeper coach in United under Sir Alex. Uh, at, yeah. at least, I think so, for at least. Uh, short period of time probably you don't know? I, I, I don't know I but think so maybe yeah. I'm 
maybe I'm wrong, but I think so. Yeah. And he always told me that he told me that like because I asked him how do like the best goalkeepers deal with criticism, and he just always said, just consider the source, yeah. where's the information coming from. Uh, yeah. That's the only thing you need to to think about. So uh, yeah, but it's all it's also difficult because. You kind of, when you're reading comments like this, you you don't really think about the source, do you? You kind of just read the comment and what the comment is saying. Yes, it's and and not right there and there. Right. It's hurtful, boom. Yeah. But then, okay, you, you're a bit mindful. You take a step yeah. back and then, okay, what is this really? Yeah, you know. And then, okay, then it's okay. Then it's easy to kind yeah. of just yeah. smile it off or laugh about it. Yeah. yeah. Good. So, and then after a while, you did really well in uh, in Volanga. So then there was uh, a next chapter that was coming, yeah. uh, a good chapter. So tell me about, I always always find this interesting, like the days leading up to the transfer and yeah, everything that goes on. Yeah, so uh, I mean, this one was a bit, a bit strange in a way that I was like, as you said, I've been doing well with it um, and I was coming to the end of my contract there. Uh, so then I think it was February or March. I had uh, some interest of a few few of the Norwegian clubs. Uh, that was in conversation with a few of the Norwegian clubs. Um, but then eventually Viv came with uh, a new contract offer, uh, which at that time was a place I really wanted to be because I just I started playing here and been performing well and like I was I was happy. Um, so I was going in to sign my new contract and then I think 25, 30 minutes before I was about to put pen to paper with the VIF for another two years. Uh, my agent comes in the door at, uh, at Valle where, where I was going to sign the contract and says, uh, you know, we got we got uh, like a decision to make it. And I was like, well, what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, and he was like, there's a, there's a French club called uh, Toulouse, who's uh, interested in you, want, want to sign you. So I was like, okay, but I'm about to go in and sign a new contract with with Voring. And like, where where is this kind of coming from? And I was like, no, they've been watching you for many, many months. They've been collecting data on you. They've been scouting you and they're like, they really want you kind of thing. So I was like, okay, there's 20 minutes until I'm going to sign a new contract here. Or do I completely like kind of sack that off and and give this French venture a, a chance. And then I decided on, it was more for me, it was more of like a respect thing for Wolleringer. That, okay, they've they've given me the chance to play here now. They've given me the chance to develop and to show myself. So I'm gonna give a bit back to them as well. And they've obviously believed in me by giving me a new contract. So I decided to sign the contract for Wolleringer and kind of forget about the Toulouse thing because I thought, okay, that could have been a good opportunity, but I was happy where I was kind of thing. So I signed a new contract with Wolverine and then four or five months into the next transfer window opened, uh, just did what I normally would do in playing, performing. And then Toulouse came back again and was really interested again. And now I was like, okay, they were so interested last time. They're still interested now. Like I have to explore this a bit more. So we had like meetings with the president over there and it all sounded like very, very interesting. Uh, I spoke with, uh, obviously with Wolleringer and they were happy to let me explore the option. So, I mean, kind of just did what I normally did and then decided, I think it was end of June, uh, would be last year where uh, I officially moved over to France and uh, signed, signed for Toulouse. Amazing. And how, how was it then to come down to Toulouse? Uh, I remember we had a, um, a walk in, in Orlesund uh, before the, 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 the day of the game. Uh, we talked about your uh, goalkeeper coach yeah, correct. and what he did when, he, when you came over or down there. So just tell me a little bit about the, the few, first few weeks there and how you, how you settled in. I think it was it was really nice uh, the way they they welcomed me the the whole club kind of thing. Uh, I remember I came down with my agent in early in the morning on at the end of June. Uh, had to do like a 
the whole team was on a training camp in Spain. So I was doing like a full medical day that was supposed to be split over two and a half days because there were so many tests like MRIs of your whole body, uh, loads of different tests you had to do. So but I did everything from, I think I was at the stadium at like 10 o'clock in the morning and I finished all my tests at nearly half 11 at night. <laughs> so it was like a 13 hour day of just testing and pictures and like wow. press conference, things like this. So it was a long day and then drive at the night for two and a half, three hours to Spain to join up with the team. Uh, and then I remember the first day I came down there, the, like I went and had like an easy training session to just get to know the people and get the testing and the travel out of my system. And then I remember after the, um, after the training session, the goalkeeping coach just like kind of said, oh, do you wanna just like have a chat, get, get to know each other? So I was like, yeah, and he said, okay, why don't you just come to my room for like this room number and uh, me here like five, six o'clock. So I came up in the room, obviously at training camp, new new place, new people again. I was a bit nervous, came in. There was two bears <laughs> stood on the, stood on the bed. Yeah. As soon as I walk in the door, opens the bear, passes in me, opens himself, and we were sat there for maybe an hour and a half, just literally talking, maybe, 10 minutes was talking about football. The rest was just talking about like life in general, how my family was, how his family was, uh, like how he is as a coach, how he is as a person, what he expects from me. And it, again, it was just so welcoming, so like warm, like you felt like, you felt appreciated already, not just as a player, but as a person. So like, it was a bit similar to like the, the Guardiola situation, but yeah. I mean, for me, it was like, it, it was so important to just the next day be able to like lower your shoulders and go and do what you're here to do. Yeah. That's brilliant. So it g kind of gave, gave you the same sensation that you had in, in City as well yeah. uh, when you came over there for trials yeah. uh, a, bit, a few years later. So uh, those, yeah, those things are so important. And the goalkeeper coach is. Like the relationship between a goalkeeper coach and a player and the first team coach or the manager is, is completely different because the goalkeeper coach, sometimes you have to be able to... I think the, the most important thing with a goalkeeper coach is that you can almost say anything to him. Hmm. You can almost discuss, even if it's not about football, but about life, if there's stuff that's difficult or if there's good stuff happening, whatever. I think the goalkeeper coach is uh, he's a goalkeeper coach in terms of the technical abilities, physical abilities, tactical, but also on a personal level, he's extremely important. Yeah. So uh, I Definitely. like that. That's that's a really nice touch of him to to do that. So. Yeah. And again, it's something. It's something small. It doesn't require anything really for someone to do something like this. Right. But I don't think people realize how how much you value it, how much it's appreciated and how, how it makes you feel when someone does this. Mm. Like it's it's so easy to do, but people kind of forget at the end of the day because they think, okay, it's a new player who's gonna come in and perform like we bought him, bought him for this much and is coming here to, to play football. But like, as I mentioned earlier, at the end of the day, we're all human beings and to be able to perform, you also need to be in like a good, good place mentally. Yeah. And in terms of training, the goalkeeper trainings, uh, you've told me in the past that it's they are they are they are tough, but you really enjoy them. Yeah, it was it was a shock to me at first because obviously it was pre-season as well, which are known for being even harder. But I think after the first five six weeks of pre-season, I was I've I've never been so tired in my whole life. <laughs> like I was obviously the heat it's, it's, it was like 30, 35 degrees every single day. That was a change as well, and the sessions were, like, as as I mentioned to you a couple of days ago, it was the most the most difficult, toughest, hardest sessions I've ever experienced. But again, in a very good way. Everything was like football related. There was goalkeeping related. Uh, it was one of the best four or five weeks of training I've ever had. Uh, I really enjoyed the physical aspect of it, but also managing to combine that with the football technical and tactical. Yeah. 
Nice. You also, uh, playing wise, it's been a bit rough in in the league, but you had uh, a cup run. So tell me about the, the cup run in Toulouse. I'll uh, happily do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was uh, again. I didn't get as much game time as I hoped for in the league. Uh, like the other goalkeeper had a really good season. He performed really well. Um, but I got my chance in the cup. Uh, played from the beginning to the end. Um, had like as normal the first few games a little bit like weaker appointment where it's games you should win uh, didn't get tested as much and then the next the two games after that was against two two um, league one teams which was for me like a new challenge again because of probably the better op opponents I played against mm. um, kept a clean sheet in one of them and won 3-1 in in uh, the other game which was against a team that I think they were unbeaten for about, they got a new coach and was unbeaten for about 16 or 17, it was something like crazy, mm -hmm. 16 or 17 games in all competitions or something like this. And then we came in the cup and managed to beat them 3-1 at home. Uh, and then <clears throat> went into the semi-finals and played against a League 2 team, um, which was, we played away at their pitch terrible terrible pitch uh, almost like we're known for being quite want to play quite a like yeah. tiki taka football yeah. if you're going to call it that uh, but it was impossible at this pitch uh, so just it's a completely different game than what we were hoping for and expecting uh, but then managed to eventually get a 2-1 win where we scored I think it was in the 87th or 88th minutes or something like this uh, and then we went into the the cup final and uh, played against uh, Nantes which won the cup the year before uh, at the, so we played at the Stade de France the National National French Stadium against I think it was about 80 81,000 people there which is oh. by far the biggest crowd I've ever <laughs> wow. played against wow. uh, which, like, it, it was a crazy experience the the French president was there and was coming to shake your hand before like there was so much leading up to the game but again it was like a weird feeling because I remember on the bus from the hotel to the stadium like I was so nervous yeah like I had like this big sweat mark. Like, I could feel. Are we going to ask you how you felt before the game? Yeah, like it, it was. I was so nervous. Like I had this like sweat dripping down before I was even getting to the stadium. Like, it was nervous and excitement. But then I remember, like, okay, like, this is normal. I said to myself, this is normal. This like it's completely fine. When I did the warm up, and then I got in the tunnel um, before the game was going to start. And I remember all the nerves just completely disappeared. Like, I didn't feel nervous at all. Like, I was kind of just in my own head. I was so excited. I was. I remember I was almost stood there, like, smiling to myself because I was so excited. <laughs> See, it was so weird being like, okay, one hour before you're there, like, almost shaking of nerves. And then, like, now you're about to go and do what you've been so nervous about when you, you're not nervous at all. Oh. It was like, it, it was a weird feeling, like, but also a nice feeling. How was it then to, to play in uh, Stade France with with eighty thousand? Do you do you even recognize all the all the uh, the all, like the spectators or are you like the public or are you just zoned in? I think when you when you walk into the stadium, like you kind of realize like wow, like this is crazy because it's, especially when it's like a cup final, you have like one half of the Toulouse supporters and one half so you can see like one half was purple and one half was yellow so it was like it was so it was like nice to see in a way mm -hmm. uh, and the atmosphere and everything was just it was it was unreal for me like French supporters they they create such a good atmosphere our supporters again are like really really good yeah. the non-supporters were really good created this like crazy atmosphere for the game but then again when it's almost like when the whistle blows for the start of the game, you kind of just, it's just background noise. Yeah. Like your focus isn't on what's going on around you. Yeah. Like you, it's, it's like 
You it's like, it's like, a, like a green noise. It's just, it's just a yeah. sound in the, in the in the distant. Yeah, it's like a background noise of people screaming. But yeah. like you can't, like all your focus is obviously on what's going on on the pitch. Yeah. So, and you won it 5-1. Yeah, it was. Uh, oh, so it's it's nice as a goalkeeper to have that in a cup final to have that, not having the one nil into injury time. You yeah. know, one one little mistake, you know, and you you can lose it all. So yeah, it was like, I think you always you always think before those games like, oh, imagine how nice it would be to be the hero. Mm. Imagine how nice it would be to make a game changing save in the ninetieth minute, but. Then again, it's also nice being able to just comfortably play such a big game and take home like such a prestigious trophy as well. And it's, I mean, it's as as a footballer, it's what you what you want to do. You you want to win trophies in, at a high level. So it was an experience I'm never ever going to forget. I think uh, I can imagine. I can imagine. I would love to have that experience as well. Wow, yeah, just winning, winning the cup in front of eighty thousand must be yeah. It was, yeah, it was crazy. I remember the like even the days after it, like we coming home from the airport. Uh, I think there was about two, three thousand supporters stood at the airport, like going crazy when we were landing. Came back to like the capital, which was like the main square in Toulouse, and did like a presentation of the trophy. There was about twenty five thousand people in the capital, yeah. just stood like waiting for us. I remember, like, even like weeks and months after, you could just walk around in the city center, going to get a coffee, and there'll be like this random guy who just go, "Hey, Chetul, thank you, thank you for winning the cup." Yeah. Like the people, like they appreciate it so much. Amazing. Yeah, it was it was a nice feeling. Because I I had the, the rather opposite when I played the cup final here in Norway. Oh yeah. Yeah, I remember we we lost three two to to Lillestrøm, uh. and I tore my meniscus early on in the first half. Oh wow! So I, I played the whole game because I was so full of adrenaline. Yeah. I bit. I did not play the greatest game. I didn't play the worst game, but it was just that kind of game. I've, I've talked to you know Thomasen, who's been the captain for the for the club for many years. Uli Jorgen, this game will always be in the back of our heads yeah. until until they die because we had such a good team uh, that season. Uh, so yeah, I remember I didn't. I it was traumatic. I didn't watch the highlights before my son <laughs> told me last uh, last year that he wanted to watch when I played the cup final. Oh wow! Did, all, did you watch it? With and him? then I watched it. And the first goal was a huge offside as well oh, no. for this time. After I think it was, I don't remember, but it was just a couple of minutes. Wow! So yeah, <laughs> but you know it. You, you, you draw experience from that as well. Yeah. You know, so... That's the thing about finals, isn't it? It's like, you're going to remember it either way. Like, yeah. it's either going to be a negative experience or yeah. a positive experience. But I think, as, as you just said, like, looking back on it, like, it's you're always going to take things from it. You're always going to learn from it, regardless if you win or you lose. But, like, going into a final, you always want to... You always want to sit with a good memory, don't you? Yeah, for so, sure. Like, for sure. I think... Losing a final would be, as you explained, a traumatic experience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but for me, I think it also it went so fast because in 2015, I played the last round with the, my last game for Brina was a relegation battle. We had to win against Bærum at home. Uh, eventually, some other results would have saved us, I think, uh, even though. But we won to one, and that was. Huge pressure, even though it was in the Uber's league and you're fighting relegation. Mm. And then it was a year and yeah, a little bit over a year, year and a half, and suddenly I was playing the biggest game in Norway. Yeah. So for me, it went really fast. I know I don't think it, I know I would have if I have gotten the chance to play it one more time. The preparations and the way I felt before the game would be totally different. Yeah, and it has so much to say. Yeah. So if I get the chance to experience it once again even if it's here in Norway or somewhere else I uh, I will look forward to it more than being anxious and nervous and yeah yeah it's it's exactly the same with me like I think with a big game like this you you think so much about it but like especially now I think for both of us as we said we both played in the final there's, there's so much we would have done differently if I was going to do the same same experience again like yeah. Okay, you, you learn from it. 
and that's that's the most most important thing I think. Yeah. Shadal, it's been an amazing episode. I've loved it. Um, what's your your goals and dreams for for the rest of your your career? Is, is there something that you really want to do? Is there like some a big thing that you? I think a, a goal for me has always been to play, obviously for the national team in Norway, uh, but also play in one of the top five leagues. Uh, so I, would, I feel like now I've done a step in the right direction uh, by being in a top top five league club, uh, but I still have uh, a long way to go and uh, a lot of hard work and hard training to be able to to reach the top. But uh, I mean. My my next goal now is uh, to finish the season good here, and uh, then we'll see what happens. Amazing, and we have to ask the question: What's uh, what's your thoughts about Volanga if they if they were to go down? Uh, I would never like to see Volanga go down. I think because it's it's both for me personally, but also for like the Norwegian football. It's for me. It's, it's such a big club. Uh, a big fan base, uh, nice stadium. It's it's not a club that belongs in the Oberliga. But then again, sometimes I think clubs like this just need like the little wake up call, like what happened with uh, Brann, who went down to Oberliga and did a really good season there, and now they're fighting for the top spot in Tippeligaen again. Yep. So I think Vålerenga have been kind of underperforming for a few years now. So maybe it's the the wake up call they need, but. I wouldn't like to see them go down, but it's it's up to them. <laughs> I have the same feeling. I really want them to stay because it's a big club. Mm. Love to play there, yeah. even though I don't think they love when we play there as an oppos- opposing goalkeeper. When you stay in front of the is it Östblocker? Yeah, yeah. They, they scream all sorts at you, yeah. and even though they threw a stone at me oh, really? when we played them here in Salzburg in 2018. It wow. became headlines in the in the news. Uh, I had I had like a wound as well on my knee. Oh, you got hit by the stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Or was it a stone? No, it was not a stone. I think it was like a, a penny or like a krona. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A that or stone. I can't remember exactly. Wow. I remember picking it up and giving it to the ref. So, <laughs> but even though I want you to stay up, so because I love playing there and they always create great atmosphere. So yeah, it's it's a game that you want to play really yeah. against against Wolverine. Yeah, so for sure, it would be nice to see them stay. But yeah. and I, I beaten them three times there, uh-huh. once in the same final of the cup, and first time was the opener of Intility, packed stadium. We won, we won two one I think, and we beat them this year as well to zero. So I have good memories there. Wow. So can't can't break the good memories. No, can't. can't. <laughs> Shuttle, it's been amazing. Thank you for for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It's and been all the best. You too. Thank you very much.